Hello everybody and welcome back to the Ultimate Fashion History for an episode in our little series, 20th Century Style Icons. I'm calling this episode Classic Judy. I'm creating it as part of our Gay Pride Month celebration here on the Ultimate Fashion History and I dedicate it to all my friends of Dorothy. When most people think of Judy Garland, I imagine they either instantly think of her in her wonderful role as Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, or they think of what I'm terming classic Judy. Judy Garland in the 50s and 60s, the era of her sellout concerts, the era of the Judy Garland television show, the era when she worked that talk show circuit, and the era when she really developed this incredibly strong and iconic signature look. But what I find really, really interesting is that she developed her own and very unique sense of style much later on, much later than any of her Hollywood contemporaries. And I have a few theories as to why. Now, we all know that Judy Garland was signed to MGM as a child. But unlike with their other stars, MGM did nothing to help Judy Garland develop her own iconic look, her own sense of style, and her own individual way of presenting in terms of fashion. This is because even here, as this incredibly pretty young girl, MGM always looked at Judy's physicality as a problem. Louis B. Mayer didn't like the way she looked. He didn't like the way her face looked. He thought her neck was too short. He didn't like her posture. He called her his little hunchback. That's nice, right? And he was forever sending memos out to the hair and makeup and costume departments, instructing them to change the way that Judy Garland looked, even though she looked so lovely. So, sometimes they would try to turn her into a glamour girl. Sometimes she'd have blonde hair, sometimes she'd have red hair, sometimes she'd have black hair. They were always changing her eyebrows and her lip shape. Sometimes she'd have bangs, sometimes they'd pull her hair back. And there is really an almost schizophrenic approach that MGM had with Judy Garland's hair, makeup and wardrobe. It's no wonder this young woman found it difficult to latch on to her own signature style. This didn't happen until she had parted ways with Mr. Mayer and in 1954 starred in the Warner Brothers movie a Star is Born, with costumes by Jean-Louis, Irene Sheriff, and Marianne Nyberg. I really believe that Judy's wardrobe, her hair, and her makeup in A Star is Born were the bedrock, if you will, for the signature style she would develop and then hold on to for the rest of her career. Of course, she updated it, but I think this was the starting point. Take a look at this gown here from A Star Is Born on the right, and then take a look at Bob Mackie's sketch for Ray Agayan's design for Judy Garland's Christmas special nine years later. And you can see, apart from the shoulder, it is essentially the same dress. Button down, new look silhouette, three quarter length fur trimmed sleeves. And there is Judy wearing it with Lorna and Joey. And I have to say hello to Calm at this point in the episode. Another look from A Star Is Born that Judy decided to keep with her for the rest of her career was this one. The oversized shirt worn over dancers tights as they are here or pedal pushers, capris or cigarette pants. There she is with another super talent, Barbara Streisand. It's the same idea, isn't it? And there she is again in rehearsals. And it's all sort of tomboyish, isn't it? Look at her tousled hair. It was very unusual for women of this era to have intentionally messy or tousled hair, but Judy did. There she is again with the popped collar on the shirt, the capris and the flats. It's very kicky and cool and sort of artsy and beatnik inspired, isn't it? And like I always say, if you have a signature look, stick 
to it if it suits you and it really did this is a candid shot of judy and she's still working this sort of beatnik look and that's a great picture of her with her cropped tousled hair the oversized shirt and the skinny pants it was sort of tomboyish and cool and a little bit nouvelle vague inspired i think don't you and speaking of iconic looks, is there anything more memorable and iconic and stylish and great than Judy Garland in the scene, Get Happy? Anyway, another element to classic Judy is undoubtedly the long gowns with tapered hems. Look how everything tapers down in these four gowns. They all have essentially the same silhouette. And this was a very good silhouette for Judy Garland because like me, she was a short lady and this gave her the illusion of being taller. All of these gowns are by the designer Ray Agayan and he was the costume designer for her on the Judy Garland show. And he really helped her carve this classic Judy signature look. Now I should say at this point, I've borrowed some of these images from a terrific and very, very informative and smart website called judygarlandcostumes.com. It's run by a gentleman who is a serious collector of Judy Garland costumes and memorabilia. I hope it's okay with him that I am using these images, but please go check out his website. It's terrific. Here's another elegant sketch by Bob Mackie for Ray Agayan, and here is Judy wearing it. Take a look at that neckline. This is another part of the Judy signature style. She loved funnel necklines, funnel collars. This, of course, is a flattened funnel, but you see Judy wearing funnel necklines time and time again. Even that spectacular zebra dress with all of those black sequins has a funnel neckline. First of all, why did funnel necklines fall out of popularity? Why have they never come back? I think they look absolutely fantastic. I'm obsessed with them. But I think that one of the reasons that Judy and Rhea Guyon favored them so much is that, and I can say this because I too am a woman who does not have a very long neck, they do lengthen the neck quite a bit. So they're corrective, but they're also very cool and very stylish. And in the early 1960s, they also spoke to kind of beatnik chic. Here's another Bob Mackie sketch for Rhea Guyon. And you can see that very tapered skirt there. And here's Judy wearing it with Barbara Streisand. And yes, I do have a 20th century style icon episode on Miss Streisand but focusing on her in the 70s. I really believe that some fashion periods suit an individual better than others. And in the early 1960s, this era suited Judy Garland so well. That was her time to shine fashion-wise. And look how beautiful some of these garments are. Look at the tailoring here. Look at the embroidery. Three quarter length sleeve, that funnel neckline again, and that slight trapeze cut. And speaking of tailoring, all of her clothes of this era were so beautifully tailored to her. Take a look at that jacket on the right with that beautiful trapeze. Why don't they make clothes like this anymore? Oh, and it has a funnel neckline, it seems. I've also noticed putting this together how much Judy liked fur trim, often on three quarter length sleeves. But take a look at that image in the middle. This is from the 1963 movie, I Could Go On Singing, with costumes by Edith Head. And when you see this in color, first of all, it's exquisite, but it plays with everything that Judy is now using as her signature style, the bugle beads, the popped collar. And was there anyone who could work the little black dress with so much drama and so much presence as Judy Garland? I absolutely love the way she looks when wearing one of her little black dresses. And it reminds me quite a bit of Edith Piaf. 
the two were admirers of each other and there they are together and yes of course there is an ultimate fashion history episode on Edith Piaf but at this point in Judy Garland's career with her sellout concerts at Carnegie Hall and the London Palladium she really had reached this pinnacle this role of the grand dame of American entertainment and it is that that Richard Avedon captured so perfectly in all of his many photographs of Judy throughout the 1950s and 1960s. I love these pictures and I really love this one. This is Avedon with Judy Garland sitting together on top of a piano and look what she's wearing. She's got the oversized shirt, the popped collar, the tights, the short tousled beatnik hair. I don't think anyone has ever disputed just how talented Judy Garland was as a singer, but in my opinion, and maybe I'm wrong, but I feel that her acting ability and talent isn't focused upon as much as it should be. She was such a remarkable actress. She was up there with Brando, in my opinion, which is why I'm so glad that when the big studio stopped hiring her, John Cassavetes cast her in what I think was probably her greatest role. In the movie, A Child is Waiting. It's not a big budget movie. It's from 1963. If you haven't seen it, Grab about five boxes of Kleenex and watch it. Judy Garland delivers the most heartbreaking, brilliant, natural, moving performance I think I've ever seen on screen. Although Judy Garland's life obviously wasn't very happy, we all know that I think by now, she has made so many people happy. She left behind a body of work that can be enjoyed and studied and appreciated forever. And I don't know about you, but I'm quite looking forward to seeing the Renee Zellweger biop, Judy, that comes out in September. I have a feeling it might be quite good. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that episode here on The Ultimate Fashion History. You can contact me and learn more about me through my website, amandahalle.com. Join our Facebook group. We always have a good time over there. Check out our books at our publishing company, Dean Street Press. I'll be back very soon with more on The Ultimate Fashion History. So just click that little circle to subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching. And hey, get happy.